Throughout history, the church has faced pressure to bend or update its message in order to keep in step with the culture. But today on Truth For Life, Alistair Begg urges us to cling to biblical truth above all else. And to do that, we have to know what the Bible teaches. As Alistair continues his series called Christian Basics, he's giving us an introduction into the essentials of the faith. We're in Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. The affirmations of the Christian faith all have to do with the being of God. They all have to do with eternal truths. And the being of God, God as God, and these eternal truths are not available to us by our own unaided comprehension. In other words, there is no intellectual route to a knowledge of God. We cannot evidentially simply get to God by thinking it out. God has given signs and indications in our moral being, in the nature of creation, and so on. But in all of that general revelation, there is only enough to convince us that we need a God. There is not enough to convert us. And it is in the special revelation that He gives in the person and work of the Lord Jesus that such a conversion may take place. Only when God is pleased to take the initiative and reveal Himself may we know Uh, just what it is and why it is we believe it. Now, it's been well said that it takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. And one of the great dangers that is represented in a study of doctrine is that it is studied in a very lopsided fashion. So you go to one church, and they emphasize one thing, and you go somewhere else, and they're banging on about something else. And you you find people, they come to Parkside, and they always have a certain question. It's probably a good question, but you can see them. I can identify them before they even speak. The same way when a doctor sees somebody walk in, he says, oh, here we go again. This will be a tonsillitis, I'm pretty sure. And of course it is. Why does he know that? He just has built up a sixth sense over time. Well, that's what happens in pastoral ministry as well. And so it is that you need to be in a church where the pastors of that church are urging you not so much to listen to what they say as to turn to the Bible from which they teach, urging you as sensible people to be like the Bereans, examining the Scriptures all the time to see if these things are so, not simply coming like birds in the springtime up to the nest to their mother so that the mother may simply drop food into their mouths and have them fly off for a little while, but rather out ferreting around in the Bible and in the bookstore and laying hold of these things and working things out and getting to grips with the first principles. It's not, we can help, we can start you off. But even with the best of attempts, it's going to involve your own determination. Now, it is then in these things that we have the anchor for our spiritual lives and the anchor for our uh, intellectual discoveries as well. Incidentally, intellect is not the key in learning Christian doctrine. Obedience is the key in learning Christian doctrine. You can be a Ph.D. three times over and a theological nincompoop. And you can be a crofter in the highlands of Scotland with a solid grasp of the Bible. You can be uncredentialed in every way, and yet you may be a teacher of the brightest intellects. Why? Because it is not about intellectual capacity. It is about morality. It is about moral response. It is about obedience to the truth as it comes to us. Well, then let me run this list. I've been telling you about the list for an hour. Let me just give it to you. And I'm just going to read them. I'm not going to stop. I daren't stop. If I stop, we're in dreadful difficulty. But we will come back, and this will be approximating to our new core curriculum that uh, will be uh, appearing somewhere in the next decade. (laughs) Number one, the unity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the Godhead. The unity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in other words, the doctrine of the Trinity. Number two, the sovereignty of God in creation, revelation, redemption, and final judgment. You're writing these things down. I told you you don't need to. I should have had a PowerPoint thing here. If I do it again, we might have one, but probably not. Thirdly, the divine inspiration of Scripture, its infallibility as originally given, its sole authority, complete sufficiency in all matters of faith and conduct. 
Next one is the universal sinfulness and guilt of human nature since the fall, rendering men and women subject to God's wrath and condemnation. Redemption from the guilt, penalty, and power of sin only through the sacrificial death as our representative and substitute of Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God. In other words, the doctrine of the substitutionary atonement. He died in our place. We can only make sense of His self-sacrificial love when we understand what it was He was doing. He bears in Himself all that we deserve. But I'm not supposed to comment on these. Uh, Next one is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Not a resurrection in the minds of people, not a resurrection in the spirits of the apostles, but a literal, physical resurrection from the dead. The necessity next of the work of the Holy Spirit to make the death of Jesus effective to the individual sinner, granting him repentance towards God and faith in Jesus Christ. And the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit in the believer and the one holy universal church, which is the body of Christ, and to which all true believers belong, and the expectation of the personal return of the Lord Jesus Christ in power and in glory. All of those are main things, and all of those are plain things. I don't expect you to have remembered more than one or two of them, but we do need to labor to ensure that this generation and the one that follows not only understands them but believes them and furthermore believes that it is so important to believe them. That's probably the greater challenge at this point. Now, people say, well, that's okay if you want to believe that kind of thing and if you want to emphasize that kind of thing over at Parkside, but it's not really—it's tangential to the main issue, isn't it? No, it's not. It is foundational. Paul's final letters that we referenced this morning are replete with warnings about false teachers. Just go to 1 Timothy, and let me show you this. 1 Timothy chapter 1, right out of the gate, he reminds Timothy, verse 3 of chapter 1, "'As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. These are the things that promote controversy rather than God's work, which is by faith. Go to the fourth chapter. You only need to turn a page. And what does he say? The Spirit clearly says that in the later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits. And he goes on to say how important it is that Timothy is aware of this, and he alerts his congregation to it. Into the sixth chapter and verse 20, and listen to how he wraps up the letter. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and in so doing have wandered from the faith. And then into his swan song to Timothy. Go to chapter 3. Back on his same story, isn't he? Verse 1, mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. And then he goes on to describe the nature of the impact of falsehood and describes these people who are both deceived themselves and they are being deceived. And he has very straightforward things to say concerning the depravity of their minds in relationship to the faith. You can see that in verse 8. And then the antidote in verse 14 of the same chapter. But as for you, Timothy, you continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of. You see that? You, know, you don't become convinced of a vacuum. You don't become convinced of nothing. There has to be a body of material that, that, that you're convinced of. Now, that is the work of the Spirit of God, without doubt. The Spirit of God confirms for us the veracity of the Bible. It is a mysterious thing but not in any self-focused way, I recognized as I prepared this talk that somehow along the journey of my life, wittingly or unwittingly, maturer people have taken me aside and made sure that I understood these things. Sunday afternoons, 
learning the Bible off by heart in a little green hut that I was sent to my, by my parents. The fellow said I could win a car if I memorized enough of the Bible. That was enough for me. I'm memorizing. Might not have been the best of motivations, but I learned a ton of the Bible. And some of you are involved in our children's ministries, and you wonder what you're doing. Well, if you're giving them the elementary knowledge of the gospel, you're actually beginning to fashion and form the very, the very lines down which their tiny minds are running. You are providing them with the wherewithal so as to be able to adjudicate as time goes by, so as to be able to detect error when it comes their way. You're at the very heart of the whole operation. And the same is true as we run throughout the congregation. Now, let me finish by making just one point of application. Because it seems to me that, in one sense, this is pretty ho-hum. People could say, well, after all, it is a church, and they do have a Bible, and there's stuff in the Bible, and they're supposed to know the Bible. What's the big deal about that? But, you know, when you read the epistles— you recognize that Paul is saying to Timothy in his generation, what actually needs to be said in every generation, and in some generations more than others? Namely, Timothy, don't fall asleep at the wheel. Stay alert to the context in which you're ministering, and make sure that those under your care are grounded in the foundations. Now, these are my observations with the help of some of my friends as I conclude, and I don't give any uh, authority to them beyond any authority that you may find in them with the concurrence of your own thinking as you consider the Bible. But it is my observation that at the present time, within the climate of contemporary evangelicalism in America, the lack of clearly defined belief is a clear and present danger. That's my observation, that the lack of clearly defined belief is a clear and present danger. And the reasons for that are multivarious. But one comes from an interesting source. Because there is a prevalent belief, if I'm listening correctly, if I'm reading publications properly, there is a prevalent belief that the only way for the church to survive in the modern world is to adapt the Christian faith in some way to that world. Now, if you know any history at all, you will know that that is exactly what liberal Christianity assumed to be the case in the early part of the 20th century. They said to themselves, if we are going to reach a world that has been ravished by these wars, if we are going to reach people who now are post-scopes monkey trial, if we are going to reach men and women who are educated and intelligent, then we are going to have to adapt our message to them. So, you don't like miracles. It's not a problem. We got rid of them for you. You got a problem with the deity of Christ. That's okay. We'll just talk about his humanity. You don't like the idea of a resurrected Jesus? That's okay. We haven't believed it for some time ourselves. And so unwittingly, generations of people hear language that sounds orthodox from lips that are unorthodox, which finally bleed into a subsequent generation the very destruction of anything that was there to begin with. Well, you say, how could that possibly be akin to what is happening today? In this way, it is an increasingly influential notion among contemporary evangelicals, some, that the way that we need to adapt now is not in adapting our theology. I'm not suggesting that. I'm not suggesting that people are saying we're going to dismiss theology. No, we're going to adapt in the form of our delivery. And that raises a very, very important question. And the question is this. Whether Orthodox Christianity 
can be dressed up in contemporary forms and still survive intact. Now, the jury's out, and it may take another generation to discover whether I am a false prophet or true. But the question is still on the table. Is it possible to appeal to the consumer mentality, to adopt the methodologies of Disney World, which creates a little world where there's no filth on the street, no cigarette butt ends, no nothing at all. Everything is wonderful, and everything nasty is buried underground. And it makes people take themselves out of the ugly world in which they live and live in a funny world that we've created specially for you. And it's all there to cater to what you want and what you need and what your children want so that you can be absolutely happy and contented and fine. Can you take that as a methodology and wrap the gospel of a crucified Savior in it without having it make an impact on the story of the gospel itself? I suggest to you that you can't. Says David Wells, the very way in which survival is being sought raises questions as to whether that strategy for survival may not in itself bring on the demise of its orthodoxy just as it did in liberal Protestantism. You see, what happens in those churches is that they're bound together not by a theological vision of the world, but they're bound together by a common strategy for reaching particular segments of society and by a common methodology for accomplishing their strategy. And, says Wells again, it is a methodology which can be hitched up equally as well to evangelical faith as to New Age belief or to anything in between. And why is this so? The reason is that there is no theological truth upon which the methodology is predicated and upon which it insists, because theological truth, doctrine, it is thought, is not what builds churches. So, let's go back to Sunday afternoon in London and ask whether that is not to go back to the future. Writing to his congregation in 1880, Spurgeon asked, how are, to we, how are we to expect the gospel to be kept alive in the world if we do not hand it on to the next generation as the former generation handed it down to us? Oh, shall it ever be said a century hence? The people of 1880 never thought of us of 1980. They let the gospel go. They allowed the doctrines to be denied, one after another. Oh, shall it be said, in ten years from now, in half a century from now, all these people, with all their slick ideas and their clever methodologies, tried to wrap up this radical message in this beautiful package. And the people grabbed the package and never got the message. But since everybody was consumed with numbers and success, they decided to settle for their apparent victory while failing to recognize that they were actually sowing the seeds of their own destruction. Does it matter what we believe? Yes, it does. Do you know what you believe? Why you believe it? I tell you, and I say it to you sincerely, we will do better as a church in the next period of time than we have ever done as a church in helping young and old to come to terms with basic Christian doctrine. Reminding us of the centrality of Scripture, you're listening to Alistair Begg and Truth For Life. We hope you'll keep listening. We're going to hear a closing prayer from Alistair in just a minute. Here at Truth For Life, we're committed to teaching God's Word in a way that's clear and relevant, but we never allow relevance to outweigh truth. As Alistair said, we don't want the package to distract from the meaning. 
When you give to Truth For Life, you're supporting that mission, keeping these messages on radio and online. In a real sense, your gift is helping pass the truth on to the next generation. As a way of saying thank you for your support today, we've selected a book that pairs well with our current series. It's titled with a question, What is a Christian? Many people grew up in Christian homes or in a predominantly Christian community. They might know the facts about God. They might even attend church. But does that mean they are automatically saved? What's the difference between being a cultural Christian and being a devout follower of God? Well, this book in 80 pages provides a concise, compelling answer to that question. It's perfect for building your own confidence in sharing the gospel or to pass on to a friend who's interested in God but has not yet surrendered to him as Lord. This is a brief book, but it has big implications. If you're a believer, this book will remind you of the distinctives that make our faith so vibrant and joyful. If you're someone seeking answers about what it means to be a Christian, this is a great place to start. Ask for a copy of the book when you donate today to support this ministry. Simply call 888-588-7884. That's 888-588-7884. Or if it's easier, you can request What is a Christian when you donate online at truthforlife.org. While you're on our website, we've got another resource that's perfect for sharing with friends who are looking for answers about Jesus. It's a short video. It's called The Story, and it explains how the cross frees us from sin and grants us salvation. The video is completely free to access. Visit truthforlife.org slash the story to watch the video or send the link to a friend. Now to close today's message with prayer. Here's Alistair. Father, we thank you that you have given to us the Bible. We thank you that you've given to us the Holy Spirit so as to illumine the printed page to us and sensitize our hearts to its truth. We thank you that you've given us intellect so that we may be able to think rationally about things. And when we think about the nature of the world in which we are set, and the blurring of so many distinctives. Save us from any undue schismatic tendencies, lest we fail to embrace all who are laboring in the gospel. But save us also from cowardice that's unprepared to say, hey, are you sure about that? Do you think that's right? Save us too from the very ease of things, from settling down to the drift. Help us as individuals to become men and women of the book. You have exalted above all things your name and your word. Every other name is subservient to yours. Every other shepherd points to you, the great shepherd. Every teacher is a learner from you, Christ, the great teacher of your people. And it is in you, Lord Jesus Christ, alone that all of our hope is found. You are everything to us, Jesus. And may we share you in the days of this coming week. For we pray in your precious name. Amen. I'm Bob Lapine. Tomorrow, Alistair continues his foundational series called Christian Basics, describing how our inward faith produces visible outward change. Be sure to join us for this important message. The Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.